Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 165 of Lonely Gods. I'm your host, David, and I'm joined here, as always, by Kate. Hi. Well, Kate, I have some good news. Oh, yeah? According to the message the uh, the Hangout just gave me, we can only record for eight hours, so this episode can't possibly be any longer than that. Well, I mean, we do have six audios to talk about, so six. we might get there. And only one of them is a short trip. The rest are pretty... Are, oh, and only two of them are sub two hours. Yeah, it's a good, good week. <laughs> oh, it's man, like a, so... It's like we had a box set or something. Yeah, Plus almost. a bunch of other shit. Basically, shut up, phone. I don't love you anymore. <laughs> I need you for my notes, but I want you to be quiet. Oh, wait, what's this? I have a text. Oh, it's from, from John. I don't care about him. Anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Doctor Who. Uh, so last time I had watched The Day of the Doctor. This time I've now watched The Time of the Doctor, Matt Smith's regeneration story. Um, I liked it. It was pretty pretty all right. Um, I think they tried to cram way too much into a yes. short period of time. I think that Stephen Moffat was like handing out answers and trying to connect everything from Matt Smith's era very very quickly and almost i want to say carelessly but cavalierly like they explain the silence and amy's crack and all this stuff like you know a couple of lines and it doesn't seem like a big moment it's just like oh yeah that's what that is and, and we're moving well, on to the next explanation <laughs> and then they just give him another 13 regeneration because the time lords are nice yeah no i know it's it was a decent but fairly hand wavy way to be like, okay, we know we're at the end and we're obviously not going to stop. So here's an yeah, answer I know. for 13 doctors. Which, which is why I feel like if, if they're going to get rid of the regeneration cycle like so cheaply, then again, there's no reason to have introduced the war doctor or to have made David Tennant count. <laughs> you know, like I, 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 that's what I said with day of the doctor. I felt like he, he made those two choices uh, to, pad out the regeneration count so he could do the uh, the regeneration cycle story, but then he, he kind of didn't. So I feel like it was kind of for nothing. And it was also like, as another example of the new series treating regeneration like it's fucking magic, like destroying Dalek ships and going out like it's a giant fucking firecracker. Like, holy shit. I remember the days when people would just kind of collapse and wake up as Patrick Troughton. Yeah. That's some bullshit. And actually, we watched that on Christmas Day while well, the rest of the world was watching Capaldi regenerate because, you know, we're current. Yeah, I, uh, I watched it <coughs> too as well. Huh. Jesus. Sorry. I, um, I caught up to where I was in the new season, so I watched the, the premiere and uh -huh. then the second episode with Bill. So I'm ready to continue watching this last season and eventually get to the Christmas special. Uh-huh. But I forgot those first two episodes are pretty good. Like season ten got a fair amount of praise from people. Yeah, like the again, the first two episodes were pretty great. Like I really liked There is there's a fair there's apparently I've been told there's there's a little bit of soapboxy stuff in the historical episodes that kinda makes me cringe and and I mean there keep in mind, kinda has been. Keeping keep in mind, I'm hearing this like secondhand, but apparently they're like in Victorian London or something, and there's a whole bunch of like colored people in the crowd and Bill's like, oh, they don't have this in the history books and the 12th Doctor's like, yeah, they whitewash history. It's like, uh, that's not actually true. Um, there there weren't, there weren't like crowds of black people in Victorian London. There still aren't crowds of black people in London. Black people are like less than 5% of the English population. Like, being inclusive is one thing. Just don't lie to me. <laughs> like, I don't, you, we should not have this discussion from secondhand knowledge. Like, no, 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 I know, I know. But I'm just, I'm curious to see if it actually is that bad. Because, I mean, a lot of the things that I've been told about Doctor Who that are terrible, I end up enjoying, so. <laughs> I don't know. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a Miracle Day fan, for fuck's sake, so. Miracle Day's great. And not according to long. most of the internet. It's it is too, too long, long, but. And the pacing gets fucked because of it, but it's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, but the thing is, like, if being too long was a was like a mortal sin for a Doctor Who story, I mean, <laughs> classic series would be in serious trouble. I mean, Miracle Day has the exact same issue that like almost every Marvel Netflix show has. They're too fucking long. Like, it didn't need yeah. to be that many episodes. Stop it. 
Oh, man. Uh, and then as far as any other newsy news goes, um, not really. <laughs> it's pretty pretty quiet on, on the Big Finish front, obviously, like the last week or so of the year. Um, they're having their Big Finish 12 Days of Christmas sale, which for me has mostly been a bust because I own everything or don't care. Like Dark Shadows, I don't care. Well, um, oh, like the soap opera? Yeah, yeah. Oh well, we're not. We're only talking Doctor Who anyway. Yeah, it is. Although I did give their uh, their Sherlock Holmes series a try through this sale, um, and even though it is a Nick Briggs vanity project, it actually is pretty good. So if you can find it cheap and you want something to listen to, it's Sherlock Holmes is pretty alright. Stamp of approval. <laughs> I always prefer like the Victorian Sherlock to like the modernized like Sherlock Elementary Cumberbatch whatever versions i like both there's time and a place i guess so my favorite sherlock movies are the the fucking robert danny jr ones so oh, yeah no i think those are my <laughs> favorite ones too like because they're, they're there's a good mystery but they're also fun action romps yep and they fight just as much as they did in the books <laughs> yeah anyway so that's that's about it as far as preamble goes so let's yeah we have a lot to talk about so let's get into it um first up uh, you're going to have to remind me what this one was about because it was a short trip <laughs> uh-huh. uh, with the first Doctor and Steven called O Tannenbaum. And all I remember is that it takes place on Christmas. And I thought that was fitting because <laughs> I listened to it like Christmas Eve. Yeah, me too. Um, so this is a Christmas themed short trip <laughs> that was released oh. near Christmas that we listened to near Christmas. And now it's after Christmas uh, by the time is, we talk about it. Is it new? Yeah, obviously. Oh, okay. I we, don't, we don't have any like backlog of the first three or four doctors oh, yeah. anymore. Uh, like we've already listened to everything. That was so. a dumb question. That is a very dumb question. So anyway, uh, basically, Stephen and the Doctor land the TARDIS in like this sort of Germanic wood at Christmas. It's very snowy, and they go to this little. The... I remember this one's about the trees. Yes, it's about the trees. So they go to the go little ahead. cabin, and there's a, a little girl there. Who's and their, their Christmas tree and their sick grandfather upstairs. I mean, the the girl's grandfather, not the Christmas tree, his grandfather. Although, um, anyway, so Stephen and the doctor kind of notice, like looking out the window, like that the trees have moved and sprouted where they weren't before, and they're like surrounding the cabin because the girl's father didn't like the the girl's grandfather. Apparently, has been like the guardian of the wood. Um and his family has been the guardian of the wood for generations because these like once upon a time, this was like barren land. And then all of a sudden there was a forest and I guess they came from outer space cause it's Dr. Who. Um, so yeah, they, the, the like ancestor, like cut down a tree and deal was like, you become the protector of the forest and we won't like turn your family into trees. Cause trees yeah. can do that. Um, cause they, when they find the father, he, one of his arms is a tree. Yeah, one of his arms is a tree. So yeah, the the uh, the grandfather is dying, and like wanted the son to come and like uh, be the new protector, but the son never really believed in it, and he cut down a Christmas tree for his daughter, and the trees are upset, so they're like laying siege to the house. Yes, and then, <laughs> and then the, like, it's it's. I like this because it's <laughs> yes, I liked it too. Um, I like this a lot, but like it starts out as like this creepy, tense thing of like, oh, these dark woods and what's going on, and then at the end, like <laughs> the solution is the doctor like marches out of the cabin and gives the trees like this seriously good just bitching out, <laughs> but what assholes they're being, <laughs> and the trees kind of reconsider and they're like, all right, we'll be friendly instead. <laughs> It um, and I, I love that I, only only William Hartnell's doctor could just like bitch out a forest and have it listen. Yeah. So um, I I definitely like this. I wouldn't put it up there with like Ghost Trap and like Flywheel Revolution. I'd put it more in like the uh, whatever the rhubarb one was. But this was definitely way better than the rhubarb one. But in that section of good, but not great short trips. Yeah, I, I enjoyed this. And I mean, for me, anyway, I like winter and I like creepy woods, so that's like an automatic plus. Um, and 
I was like, part of my enjoyment of this was just relief because as soon as I read, okay, Christmas comp or not Companion Chronicle, this is almost a Companion Chronicle because Peter Purvis is the reader, so Stephen and the Doctor are his roles on during the Companion Chronicles anyway. So it's basically a Companion Chronicle just without a second actor. Yeah, it's less of an audio book than a lot of short trips tend to be. But anyway, um, you know, when I, when I read the description of this, of like, oh, trees that move in Christmas time or whatever, I was like, uh-oh. And uh, actually, in the description, and this is what was kind of trolly about it, um, I've got the description right here. The last line of the description is, and of all the trees in the wood, who really bears the crown? So when we're talking about evil trees and Christmas and crowns, I'm like, this better not be those fucking like wardrobe trees from the Matt Smith special. I was no, so they scared weren't. because I fucking hate, <laughs> hate that episode. Turned out it had nothing to do with it. Thank Christ. It's, I don't remember it being that bad, but you it's tend so to irrationally hate things more than I do. It's so stupid because you haven't seen the other tree episode yet. Okay. Will Wait, you there's calm another down? tree episode. There's another tree episode. It's, but I I'm like a good sure creepy tree very... episode. I just don't like it when it's like. It's not creepy. It's in your next season. It's about. It's it's there's a forest in London and it's modern times and stuff with uh I can't remember her name. Yeah, whatever. As far as new series stuff goes, personally, I think I might have brought this up before, but I heard a rumor through the grapevine that there's going to be a complete Capaldi box set that's going to be retailing for about 150 which is yeah. way, way cheaper than the individual seasons. So I'm, I'm waiting for more Doctor Who new series until that comes out or is confirmed or whatever. So it's only two seasons, though. It's three seasons and, like, three or four Christmas specials. Eight, nine, ten, yeah. I don't remember there being two Peter Capaldi seasons already before ten. Well, there were. Anyway. <laughs> I'm glad you're the host of a Doctor Who podcast and you can forget whole seasons. Um, the last thing I had to say about O'Tannenbaum is that Stephen, in his narration, talks about his own time where people kind of celebrate Christmas still, but they don't really have any sort of like context for it anymore and like he mentions that like there are no forests like that in his town i'm like your your world sounds fucking depressing <laughs> poor yeah. steven anyway so next up we have uh our second doctor early adventure this time with jamie and zoe called the wreck of the world it's which a pretty is pretty ominous title Yes. Well, the, the world, it turns out, is a giant colony ship that disappeared. Zawarudo? Yes, the world. Shut up, Kate. You don't watch. Everybody. You don't watch JoJo. I know everyone Everybody around. who's on the internet has effectively watched JoJo. <laughs> That's true. Um, that is true. Although it makes me wonder if there's, like, other colony ships called, like, the Hierophant or the Fool out there. <laughs> So can you imagine being bundled up like everybody gets to go on something cool like oh yeah I'm going aboard judgment oh yeah I'm I'm going aboard the moon and then it's like oh fuck I've got the fool we're fucked aren't we you're not you're talking you know that's why it wasn't called it wasn't called the world after the tarot it was called the world because it was transporting a world Kate it's stupid that's a dumb name for a ship doesn't matter <laughs> why you call your ship the world. That's Most, how people but, I, that's how people live in asteroids and don't know it. Like this, Kate, is, the, this is how a TNG episode starts, and I'm Kate, gonna fuck with that have shit. Stupid names, and you know this. That's not true. Most boats have dumb names. There are more stupid named boats than there are good named boats. Like okay, in, disproportionately. In like, real it's... life, yes, but in in space, there's supposed to be cool things like Valkyrie and Excalibur and fucking. Galactica and Enterprise and, you know, cool things. Not the fucking world. And actually, you know what? The one sci-fi series that actually has realistic boat names that sounds stupid is Halo. Like, who the fuck names their ship in Amberclad or Pillar of Autumn? That's retarded. Anyway. 
of the world. <laughs> so I read them. All right, go ahead, Kate. Lay it out for us. Oh, holy fuck. So, once upon a time, not too long ago, the Doctor and Zoe and Jamie were hanging out in the, the fucking void between galaxies because the TARDIS was broken because they escaped from the land of fiction. And if you remember the mind robber, it, the TARDIS kind of like fell apart and put itself back together because that was just that kind of story. So Zoe's out in a spaceship suit, space suit, and she's like welding the TARDIS cracks together, I guess, because uh, why not? But anyway, and then there's supposed to be no ships out here, but then the TARDIS like smacks into a ship, a giant ship. It's called the world. And Zoe is like separated because that's what happens when you're outside something that crashes into another thing instead of just going smush. And she runs into this robot whose name that I can't remember, but it's a very annoying robot. And the robot is crazy and wants her to fix the ship. And Jamie and Zoe, or, or Jamie and the Zosher look for her and run into these like relic hunters who are like, don't take our shit. That's bad. And they try to unravel the mystery of like why everyone on the ship like was lost and why it went off course and why everyone's dead and why the cryo tubes are open and zombies are coming out of them because that's not normal. Yes. And it turns out it was like this crow thing that represents yeah. evil and, and pollution. Yes. I, I, didn't we deal with the crow thing before? Well, there was the fourth Doctor story, Night of the Storm Crow. But I don't think it's the same crow thing. I remember a di I remember something similar to the crow thing. This, you know, I thought the crow thing was stupid in the story, but the story wasn't bad. No, I, I enjoyed it. I mean, I, I liked that the crow it's thing... It's a good ride. It's a really entertaining it's, ride. It's, well it's a, yes, yes, very much so. And I mean, like, I liked that the crow thing, like, we've had a lot of entities that, like, feed on negativity and evil and whatever. And the crow thing doesn't feed on evil so much as it feeds on, like, greed and pollution and, like, decay. Which is interesting, because it makes it more like a... Less of a predator and more like a carrion eater, you know? Yeah, it's just trying to cause the carrion. Pretty much. And so that's... That was kind of a more of an interesting angle than being like, I am the evil elder god of the raven cult. Ooh, and it's like, no, I want this ship to drift and be rusty because I like it that way. We also got some really good uh, Jamie and Zoe moments. Zoe got to be super smart and deal with lots of computer stuff. And Jamie, yeah. got, <laughs> Jamie got to show his indomitable spirit. There's a great scene where they first encounter these scrappers and one of, one, one of the uh, non human human creatures is like this big burly rock monster alien that Jamie charges and it knocks him all like a like hundred feet away all the way across the room and he just gets up and keeps doing it and he like knocks him back like twice before the doctor tells him to stop and I'll have to say like hats off to the sound design there's a great Doppler effect of Jamie just going ah, yeah. ah, ah. <laughs> like so good you okay I'm all good <laughs> Uh, yeah, good times. Um, and it's yeah, it turns out like th there's like a scientist with the with the scrappers that are like it's not like a scrapping operation per se. They're like trying to like harvest the the stuff because the world had like a bunch of uh, <laughs> a bunch of like human like relics and art and culture and stuff yeah, that from from old the, Earth, which by this point is like long gone because it's they've been drifting for like a million years or something. It's it's. It's a big misdirect because when you were yeah. first introduced to the scrappers, they're acting like filthy thieves, like they're acting like pirate assholes. Yeah, but they like, actually belong uh, in a museum. Yeah, they're they're here for a museum to get stuff for a museum, and it was like, oh, well, why were you being such a fucking asshole before then? <laughs> well, I mean, anybody who's listened to Bernie Summerfield audios would know that archaeologists are complete assholes in this universe. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, but no, I like the wreck of the world. Um, yeah. It, it was a thoroughly entertaining story, even though the crow thing was a little... I'd... But, I mean, it's a, it's a creepy derelict ship full of zombies. I mean, that's going to, you know... Yeah. Um, and it was nice to get, like, some more background on the colony ships. That I mean, it's... It, when colony ships seem to be, like, the, the really, like, singularly core thing of, like, Doctor Who's future of humans is very kind of scattershot. 
but but the colony ship thing is like one of the very few like commonalities between like any era of the show. So it's nice to get it some background on that. In the second episode of Peter Capaldi's last season is about a colony ship. Yeah. So. And micro but, and nanobots. One of the things that made me laugh about this though is that the the, the world is apparently like run on treadmill power. <laughs> it's like that. <laughs> Which is hilarious to me. That black it's like run, there. Jamie. Run. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Power the blast doors. The... Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> have you seen Black Mirror, Kate? That's. I have not seen Black Mirror. The treadmill episode is like one of the best episodes of that show. <laughs> and then I felt bad because like the Dougie Jones robot. Like got left all alone at the end because because its power like depended on the ship. Don't so, call it Dougie. It wasn't that wonderful, and it wasn't that wonderful. But it was also like insane and only like repeated the last few words anyone said. Yeah. Also, it, it made autistic screeching when you asked it a question it didn't want to answer, which is like, please never do that again. <laughs> and then it kept doing it. And then yeah. it kept doing it. I mean, even Zoe in the in the audio like it's commented like, please like please, that. that's extremely annoying. Do not do that. <laughs> So, which which made me hate it less, but man, <laughs> it's there were there were a lot of good parts of the story. Like I said, the 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 end explanation isn't what I would prefer, but it was done fine, and and it's such it's such a well written, just these these are two hour stories, and and this one moved very well. It was very entertaining. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely like you said, it's a, it's a ride. And it's it's a fun one. It's not gonna. I don't think it's gonna be topping any best of list. No, but it's, it's definitely it's definitely getting a positive response online. But as as we've said before, like especially with like the Tom Baker audios, like the the initial response for these things because it's such a niche is always like the hardcore who are gonna love it, and then you kind of wait till it evens out later and see what people really think. But uh, most most of the Tom Baker audios are very mediocre. So yeah, Tom Baker audios are thoroughly average. For the most part, except the ones with that feature Charlotte from the Village, which is only one. So, you know, oh, Charlotte from, I miss Charlotte from the Village still. I also miss Charlotte from the Village. I hope that you're ready for more though, because next month, uh, the, the next, the seventh season of uh, Fourth Doctor Adventures, they're they're moving to a box set format. So the first half of the season, the first four episodes are coming out next month. So I hope you're ready for that. Okay. That'll, that'll, I think that'll probably be our only new release next month, though. Okay. Well, we should break it up, then. Yeah, unless you want to do River Song, because Peter Davison's in that one. But we haven't been following River Song, so jumping in Season 3 is probably not a good idea. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Uh, and then probably what? at least wait. Wherever her first season's supposed to start chrono chronologically, we should... Started then. Well, you know, River is such a clusterfuck that I've just kind of like put it off into like the point in the new series where it. Just I was gonna say maybe out. we wait like, until the, the the library episode. Well, yeah, even even like I just I just it's it's a it's a clusterfuck. I don't even want to deal with it, <laughs> but we will. So, <clears throat> anyway, so let's move into our fifth Doctor audio because we have four of them this week. Yes, and we the do. first the first up is a. Uh, Fifth Doctor, Tegan, and Turlo narrated Companion Chronicle Freak Show. Yes, uh, this is another uh, this is the third and final of the Companion Chronicles that we've covered from the Companion Chronicles specials box set. Um, initially, this was released as one of those Doctor Who magazine freebies. Okay. Um, and yeah, it's narrated by Mark Strickson, who plays what Turlo, of course. What was the last one that we that that was given away for free that we talked about? Uh, I think like it might have been Cuddlesome. Was yeah, the last it was one. Cuddlesome. That's what I was going to say. That's, it was about a toy. Yeah, so, but that's not that's better. not in this. I'm just no, I'm sorry. I know. That's but not I'm in this saying, box set. I know. I'm just saying that this is a much better story to fucking give away for free than like a bad audio. Probably a lot of the Doctor Who magazine freebies have been like before the Companion Chronicles were a thing. They tended to be like normal episodes, like Cuddlesome, and there was another uh, another one called um, Living Legend that was a Paul McGann one that that we. I mean, Cuddlesome was bad because it was a classic Doctor doing a new style story, and it was a bad new style story. I didn't hate it, but I understand where you're coming from. Um, let's see what else is there. Yeah, Last of the Titans was McCoy, Ratings War, No Place Like Home, Living Legend, one of the unit stories. 
uh, yeah, pretty much. So uh, Freak Show, I mean, Freak Show is a good story. It's not amazing. It's not great. No, um, but I enjoyed it's it. A, it's an hour-long companion chronicle. It's fairly simple, and it's a fairly simple premise. It's uh, the, the TARDIS crew lands in, what is it? Is it the late 1800s? It's, it's the very early 1900s in Arizona. We're in old, yeah, we're in the Old West. In the Old West, which is, again, plus one bonus <laughs> yes, for me. Um, to, to be fair, like the Old West setting really doesn't do a whole lot in the story no it, it, it no. starts off with a bang and i was like "Ooh, this will be interesting and then the actual story is just about a traveling carnival <laughs> where it turns out their freak show is all like they're all aliens captured all aliens, aliens with yeah. like chips in their brains and so like the, the uh the the large uh the larger plot is like so the the showman of the very very hammy showman who is the second voice in this uh, in this story uh is trying to sell the locals like snake oil elixir because he like has like a holographic glamour field or whatever so like it looks like when he feeds the elixir to these aliens he's passing off as freaks that they turn into normal people and he wants to sell this to the townsfolk uh but the elixir actually just contains like a pathogen parasite that will like incubate his species in the townspeople yes because that's gross so um, and basically, like, this all happens, like, th when the TARDIS lands, like, this is right after Enlightenment, so, like, Turlo is still kind of, like, you know... Shell-shocked. Sh uh, still a bit shell-shocked, and Tegan, like, will not give this guy a fucking break. Like, she's just bitching at him constantly and, like, questioning his every move, second-guessing him, like, chewing him out, and he's like, I've had fucking enough of this. I'm going out to the store for a pack of smokes. And he just, like, storms out of the TARDIS, like, marches through the desert to find the town. <laughs> Yeah, and considers just not coming back because of Tegan, which is it's it's a good it's a cool moment for both characters I think because I get where Tegan's coming from. I get yeah too. It's like it's like you were under the influence of an of a cosmic evil and trying to murder us. <laughs> like like what are you doing here still? Yeah, but at the same time, it's like yeah, I understand Trillo kind of kind of, you know, said yes to the Guardian in a moment of weakness and, and very quickly realized that he didn't want to. And I think even the Doctor points out, like, he did try and kill himself. Like, yeah, clearly there's remorse here. Um, yeah. They, and I and this is this is made especially amusing because I, I mentioned this in in Gardens of the Dead or other uh, as a Turlo short trip. But I really like Mark Strickson's like very snotty rendition of Tegan. <laughs> Just yes, really funny. No, I love his impression of Tegan. It's really, it is really funny. <laughs> really, really snotty. Um, but anyway, yeah. So you know, the doctor comes and and they have a run around, and the, the beast man in the cage is actually a nice guy, and they and they take the control thing back and, and the undo the thing and run the guy out of town, and everything's fine. But the beast man sacrifices himself to save all the others. Oh yeah, because he fights the big snake. Yes. There's, well, they're both big snakes. There were two. Yeah, I felt bad because like this was a good character and it was a it was a nice moment. But I kept thinking of like the erudite Sasquatch from fucking Sam and Max. <laughs> God damn it, Kate! <laughs> like their fucking Sasquatch convention. And I liked um, I liked the Beast Man too because like he has a good moment with her. It gives Turlo a really good character moment. Where oh yeah yeah yeah. Kate. Because Turlo, I guess the sh the showman realizes he's an alien and like throws him in the fucking cage yeah. with with the beast man, and that's like the cliffhanger to part one where it's like, oh fuck, I'm locked in here with this giant ferocious thing, and he's like, hello. <laughs> yes, it's really great. <laughs> Would you that like a spot of tea? I get it because that is a total Sam and Max moment. Is oh we're locked in this cage with this monster and this oh hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a nice. legomorph. So uh, yeah, no freak show was good. Um, enjoyable yes so next up we have our first in the trilogy of monthly range story cobwebs which also sees the return of Nyssa yeah it does so I, was it was wondering, I was wondering how you would react to that I was just like what the fuck is Nyssa doing here why is <laughs> she haven't just had enough left. audios with her <laughs> she just left <laughs> like literally <laughs> Yeah, I mean, she did. explain it in the story that she's been gone for fifty years, her time. Yeah, and it's been two days. Yeah, 
which uh, yeah, for for the doctor and uh, and and his companions, it's been two days, which is interesting because it's like in two days that means you had to do Enlightenment and Freak Show, which is like. Well, Enlightenment was a day, and Freak Show was one other day. So it's like, I, well, I, you, I guess so. You you you've strung yourself up. You can't you know. You can't do put any a bunch more. more stories in here. You you've artificially set this time already. Yep. And even so. then, it's like you you had a very busy day. <laughs> yes. So anyway, yeah. What do you think of bringing bringing back Nissa later in life? Um, I'm fine with it. I thought it was really funny. Mm-hmm. That I mean, she's not much. She's she's older, but like. She even says that, you know, Trocken's age differently. But I thought it's a fun way to explain why she actually sounds older. I, I still think that, like, out of all the many actors and that have done Big Finish, like, Sarah Sutton doesn't sound, like, hardly Much any different no. than she did on right. TV. Like, I understand, like, you know, the other end of the spectrum is, like, Deborah Watling, who sounds like my aged grandmother and does <laughs> not play a convincing teenager. Uh, you know, but... So I mean, out of, of all the people who who could benefit from an explanation like that, Sarah Sutton not, for me is not one of them. Like but she, it was, she sounds really. If, if you look at the cover, they use a current photo of Sarah Sutton now for Nissa, and not not like her photos from the TV show. So yeah. at least like visibly, she's aged. But uh, and the other thing too is like Nissa. Nissa's character is not much different. No, because. And it's not not necessarily a slight on the writing, but the thing is, is that Nissa was already a pretty mature character. She was already a good person. She was already compassionate. She was already logical. Like, you know, she. I don't want to say she didn't have room to grow because she totally did. Because her her big flaw was being naive. Yes. Um. And and kind of not very worldly. Um. But in terms of her actual like behavior. She's not very different, and it, 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 I almost feel like this would be a more interesting thing to to pull with somebody like Stephen, who, as we know from the Companion Chronicles, becomes you know a world leader, or you know if even if you had like when he brought back Tegan, if she had you know matured further, for example, like somebody who was already kind of like who would end up yeah. in a very different place than we left them. Whereas Nissa, it was more like I've been doing the exact same, for, yeah, for, for so fifty I like, years. I so. like that she has a purpose and that she's trying to cure these incurable diseases and stuff. Yeah, and her her friend robot, Loki. Loki. Which yes. it was. I was like, why did you name it Loki? That's just a waste. It, because. But uh. But and, and it was funny because I looked at this. I, I when I started listening to this audio, I saw the cover and I was like, "Fuck, are we doing spiders again?" And it's called cobwebs. And I just, I, I don't. I like spider. Well, I don't like spiders, but you know what I mean. I, I think spiders can be used effectively. I feel like Doctor Who never uses spiders correctly. Well, I mean, I think in this one, it's it's interesting because the spider creatures on the cover are not the source of the cobwebs. No, uh, there's robot maintenance spiders, and then they're and they're I mean, they're, they're more crustaceans spiders. than they are. Yeah, spiders. they're not actually spiders, so I was totally fine with it. I like this story quite a bit, actually. Yeah, I really enjoyed this too. It's I think it's a very strong story, and it's, it's an a, it's. An, it's a Sorry. really good sci-fi, just like normal Doctor Who story with a timey-wimey factor thrown in that I think works really well. Like, I like both. Like, it feels like it's two different aspects of the story, and they both work really well. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, when we open, Nissa and Turlo are still, or Tegan and Turlo are still, like, screaming at each other in the TARDIS, because why wouldn't it be? Um, and the TARDIS, like, gets dragged off course, like it often does, to land in this, like, derelict facility. And meanwhile, Nissa is also there hunting for something because she is working on curing Richter's syndrome, which is a terrible, terrible virus that's affecting billions of people. And it was and thought like, to, yeah. it was thought to be extinct, but then this like horrible new strain kind of just came out of nowhere years ago. And and this facility that was that was kind of like lost contact with apparently had a cure. So she's there with her robot friend to look for it. And they run into each other, and then they look in the medical bay, and their skellies are there. And so clearly, they go back in time because, like, the base computer Edgar is like, "Hey, you guys, you promised not to leave me in the dark, and now I'm insane." And they're like, "Uh, what the fuck?" Yeah. And so between that and the fact that their skelly is dressed in their clothes or in the med bay, they're like, "So clearly, we go back to the past, and something terrible happens." And Tegan's like, "Let's not do that." <laughs> Everyone's well, like, he- "Fuck you, Tegan. We have to." 
as soon as they find out that they've been there before, Tegan wants to go investigate, and the doctor's like, "No, you don't want to. You don't want to know the future." Well, she wants to know the future, but then as soon as she turns out that it's like you're, you're fated to die here in the past, she's like, "Let's just go home." <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, and then so once they go back in time and they end up uh, making contact with the crew who work for the company, and I I don't know if it's the same kind of company that. They're the same company that like was after Zoe and her companion chronicles or not, but they seem pretty ruthless. So maybe or was the one that Cuthbert runs. Uh, well, that's the conglomerate, though. That's that's oh, yeah, very yeah. different than a company. But anyway, so the research crew. It's interesting because um, it's like the secret company facility, and the company is developing a cure for the for the virus using the cractids, which is like these spider crustacean creatures that have a natural immunity. To yes, it. Well, yes. But so they're trying to adapt it to like the human immune system. And it, what's interesting is that like the researchers, I guess this is standard practice for the company, but they have their memories like taken right. away and stored in crystals so they can focus only on the uh, on the project and then they kind of get those back once the, the project is over. Yes. And it turns out the security hard ass who's very suspicious of the doctor, like he's an industrial spy or whatever. It turns out once he gets his memories back that he himself is in fact the industrial spy or whatever. Well, but he also has gone completely insane. Yes, he has. He was already a paranoid just asshole. So yeah, there was like, like there's like ruins or something, or at least he thinks there are. There's, and there's not, there, yeah, there are alien ruins, but they're just like ruins. ruins. And he thinks he can in in like a batch of symbols. There's that, like some sort of code. Yeah. No, no, no. It's not a code. It's that it's their, it's it's his and the other two crew members' real names carved in stone to say that oh they they're not sent here by the company. They've always been here. Like mm, they right. These are the ruins of their own civilization. He's he's gone completely mad. He's nuts. Um, and he he continues to be nuts once he gets his his memory back, but in a different <laughs> a different way because he like. So yeah, like they engineer the cure to the virus, and he like shoots everybody else, or 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 like well, he gets his he, memories back, realizes he's a double agent working for what is it, a third party? He just says like a, an, it's independent, the, an independent, yeah. Who who he needs to get a sample of the cure and the virus, the the engineered virus. Um, I don't know why. I don't know if it's also for profit like it is with the company because the whole thing is they want a cure and then they're going to create a strain of the virus that can only be dealt with through the cure to make with their money. product yeah to make money so but like yeah and then the security guy like he he attacks the other two uh workers and then like edits the the memory files that they upload so that they end when he attacks them so that it looks like they died and then he does the same to himself and yeah he like tries to take off in the shuttle um, so there's a great moment where they realize, like, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense, because who would upload the memories if you're dead? Yeah, and you know what? I, I have to say that maybe I'm dumb, but that never occurred to me either until they mentioned it. And I was like, hey, yeah, <laughs> that doesn't make sense. But yeah. I, think, I think I'm almost, like, conditioned at this point through through sci-fi to have, like, perfect recordings and of the video games. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it's... uh. I really like cobwebs. I really like this story. Oh, well, we didn't mention, so they go back in time, and um, it turns out that Edgar, the, the AI that was running the base that lost his mind, has hitched a ride on Mrs. Robot Loki and stuck himself back into the computer and is driving the non-insane version of the base insane. Yeah, basically he causes himself to go crazy <laughs> as part of a stable time loop. Yes. <laughs> So that's good. I really, I really like this story. I, I liked, I liked all the time stuff. I really liked the the AI losing its mind and just pity me, pity, pity Edgar. Pity, pity poor Edgar, alone in this dark. Um, um, yeah, this is definitely my favorite story this week. I think yeah, it's mine too. I, I really liked the 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 twist where it you know they reveal how. Um, they're here for these nefarious purposes and it's really disgusting. And then the, the commander is just like, okay, well I'm doing this for my kids. So whatever. But the, the genetic engineer or whatever doesn't, doesn't want her memories back. Cause she's like, what if it turns out I'm this terrible person and I don't, I'd rather be a blank slate. And yeah. there's this really like, I like that intense scene where we watch, uh, 
what was it Bragg, the security asshole guy, destroy uh-huh. her memory crystal so she can't get them back? Yeah. I mean, she ends up dying, but she ends up dying anyway. But I mean, yeah, it's it's um, it's it's a strong moment. It kind of reminded me of the better parts of Dollhouse. <laughs> <laughs> or, or it's like, you know, what if I don't like who I actually am? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I, I'd highly recommend this, but if you're going in, do keep in mind that Nyssa and, look at, and her looking for the Richter Syndrome cure is the longest, like, story arc for the Fifth Doctor on audio. So if you get this one, you're kind of in for a long ride. Oh, uh, okay. Um, but yeah, no, it's good. Um if, if I had any complaints, it's just that a lot of the characters just felt like archetypes we've seen a bajillion times, especially Bragg. Yeah, although I did like the twist with him that he is exactly the kind of person he suspects the Doctor is. <laughs> well, but, then the, but the downside to the twist was is once they reveal who he is, he's like, okay, you've literally just become a generic Doctor Who villain now. Yeah, that's I, true. I like I liked the space madness Bragg. Like, when, when he takes the Doctor to the ruins, he's like, can't you see here? It's... it's it's my, it's our names written here, and it's like, oh Jesus Christ, you you're completely cuckoo bananas. You're totally cuckoo for cuckoo, cuckoo puffs. But even even so, I found it like it was an enjoyable sort of time travel mystery. Um, the only real failing for me, I think, was just that they they have there's a lot of elements in play. There's the rogue AI, there's the crackdids, there's the maintenance bots who are the source of the fucking cobwebs by the way um there's yeah. there's the industrial espionage thing there's the virus there's bringing nissa back there's turlo and tegan dealing with the guardian thing like there's a lot of shit in this audio and i i feel like they almost stuffed in too much but they pulled it off very well it's so it's hard to be mad about hard. yeah this is definitely one of those highlights but it's really packed but but yeah if you if you start this you're probably just gonna end up finishing the storyline so yeah you're you're in for like f- four or five trilogies basically if you're doing oh, this so so nissa sticks around for a while then well i mean she there's she, there, she's looking for that richter syndrome care you know or does or does it is it not all chronological or no it's all chronological i mean it, like sequential i mean yeah it's it's a i mean it's I'm sure we break sequence to get other doctors in, but yeah, 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 yeah. Like, for for example, like Cradle of the Snake, our third our third chapter of this story arc is one thirty eight in the monthly range, and then the next chapter is one forty six because there were other doctors in between. Yeah, but for the fifth doctor, it is sequential. Yes, almost, Damn. almost sequential. There are a few one offs like Demons of Red Lodge that were throwbacks, and but oh yeah, that was okay. Yeah, but anyway, um. So next up, we have the second in in our trilogy and in the story arc, um, The Whispering Forest. Yeah, this was not my favorite. <laughs> oh, really? Because I like this one better than Cradle of the Snake. I but think I'm... this, for me, this was the weakest one, and, and the big reason why is that this is basically just a retread of Face of Evil, but with germaphobes instead of a Seva team. I did have some issues with it. I liked it. But uh, yeah, no, I definitely did have some issues with this because uh, the Whispering Forest is nothing we've not seen before. No, it's it's the same plot. It's like they the the Doctor and friends land in the tar- in the fucking forest because the Doctor told the TARDIS to like listen out across history for mention of the Richter syndrome so that they could you know track down more stuff um, and. It, they they turn into this like colony of people who are like extreme oh, well, germaphobes. Side note, because we didn't mention during cobwebs, um, Loki gets destroyed, mm-hmm. and uh, Nissa's ship also the, the maintenance robots blow up Nissa's ship so that they they have to help Edgar. Yeah, so she um, she comes um, with because traveling I mean, with the doctor. Yeah, yeah. Like what else would you do? Anyway, so yeah, these, there's this col- this colony of like weird yahoos who are who are like germophobic to like a religion of it almost they're all like pinkish red because they scrub so much and they just, scrub so much and it's because they're like yeah and it's like so like face of evil where, where they have the remnants of like a survey team that becomes the seva team warriors and and the tesh that became the technicians right these these people are from a, a a hospital ship that had crashed and over the generations they've basically turned it into this religion where they're like the the surgeons or sir john's uh 
tenets of like scrubbing constantly and cleanliness and all this stuff is like taken to this obsessive level. Yeah. Okay. And naturally, and, doctor is a is a word of power because you know. And there's there's weird robots that that are humanoid in shape and have like crazy red hair, so they think Turlo is one. Well, they're they're like glowing red caps on them, so they think Turlo yeah. is, is bad because like yeah, the, the robots that come and they like take people away in the night who are sick or dying, and the the takers like that they're called, which I think is a corruption of caretakers, but they're they're, they're never really seen by the villagers, uh, so they yeah they just know that oh they've got red heads, so Turlo is clearly an evil robot. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there's also like this. There's like this power struggle in the village, which is called Purity Bay. Um, and see, and you know what? Maybe you are like, I'm just fucking over the Mara. Like, I, I, I that's, I, that's why most of my issues with Cradle the Snake have to do with. But well, this one we'll, was. We'll get to that. More, this one is weaker, and like I liked. I like the medical aspect. Like, yeah, it really is just um, face of evil. Face of evil again. But I, I like the twist. But the power struggle was so fucking boring. Yeah. And so it's like, the, like the the when we get there, like the the village leader has been taken by the takers. His daughter, played by Haley Atwell, who you probably know is Agent Carter from the Marvel films. Um, oh wow! She's she's like stepping in because the the authority is supposed to fall to her, but her evil stepmother wants it instead. Who is, to be fair, hateably evil. Um, but again, it's something you haven't seen before, for sure. And there are a few nice elements at play in this story. Like I like I agree with you. Like the the, the medical like sterilization obsession is interesting. Um, and it yeah. does turn out that like. The, there was some kind of disaster where, like, there was an outbreak of the engineered Richter syndrome on the ship, and they they crashed. And th also, there's ghosts in the forest because they're like the crew that's out of phase or some shit. But anyway. yeah, there was a warp drive failure that caused the other crew to go out of phase, and then they can possess. And I like that they could possess the medical caretaker robot. Yeah, and it's like I don't know. It's it's. It's just very kind of middle of the road stuff. It's definitely a letdown after Cobwebs was so packed with so many developments. And then we kind of get this, and it's kind of like this pit stop. And they, I mean, yeah, it, it kind of tangentially has something to do with Richter syndrome, but for the most part, it's got nothing to do with shit. It doesn't like advance the search in any way. Um, I other like, than being like, like, I like, I like the reveal and the, the mystery of what was actually happening here. Like, how did this civilization come about? But, like, all of the politics stuff was so bad. And the the main villain character, like, her motivation didn't even make sense. Because they make her seem like, oh, she's trying to get power. And then it's like, I, I couldn't decide. Like, the story didn't seem to want – sorry, not I couldn't. The story didn't seem to want to decide whether or not she was just a power-hungry megalomaniac or this, like – she I was, don't want to say puritanical like, or like or like this religious zealot. Like it couldn't make up their mind whether she was incredibly crafty and intelligent and or just insane. Well, I mean, I, I lean more towards the religious zealot aspect of it because I mean she's she's you know, but, she but leads an she leads an assault on the robot stronghold and it like is totally yeah, well, baller like, throughout that whole thing of like totally gung ho to go through it with it, even though everyone else is running away, and I and like, like she well, scrubs felt, herself to the point where she bleeds and is like this yeah. is the purity of my blood, <laughs> like motherfucker. Well, in the first half of the story, she felt more clever and intelligent, and then the second half, it was like, nope, this is who she is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and that's it, really how how it is. Yeah, it and just I, I'm so sick of that type of character. And then it and and then unlike in cobwebs, it's like then all of the supporting cast, it's like, are they just that stupid? Like, why is it only these these two, the the two the the evil woman and her henchmen, and then the daughter and then her friend who gets murdered? Her like, why are they the only intelligent people in this entire story that aren't the doctor and the companions? Like, yeah, I kind of don't like it when when sci-fi kind of like they portray everybody on the planet as primitive fucking screwheads. Yeah. Yeah, me either. Because it gets boring like that. Yes, which is one of the issues with this story is like there's 
they, it's this huge fucking village, and there's only four characters we ever talk to because everyone else is a goddamn moron, and we don't need to talk to them. Yeah, who are very easily swayed. Anybody, yeah. who, anybody who makes a speech, they're on their side. <laughs> <It went back laughs> Until somebody like, else makes a speech, and then the villagers the, are on their side. The whiplash back, and it just reminded me of like. It, it reminded me of, like, mob scenes in, like, Mel Brooks comedies. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I didn't get a harumph out of you. <laughs> yeah, so... So, yeah, I mean, it's not a terrible story. It's No, but it's nothing, it's it's very nothing. average, and it's yeah. it, it points off, basically, because it's, it's shit we've seen before. And not only is it concepts that we've seen before, like, this exact storyline has been done already. I mean, we've... That that happens often in Doctor Who, but but yeah. this is this is a, like an especially blatant one. I yes, think. it really is. Like I didn't see it when I was listening to it, but as soon as you mentioned Face of Evil, I was like, oh fuck! <laughs> How did they do that? Why did they do that? Yeah, I don't know. And and like I said, now that we're we're in the middle of a of a of a story arc, this isn't good enough to be worth including. No, because it doesn't advance the story arc. <laughs> no, and I mean. Even, even like it's okay to include some standalones in the mix during a, a story arc. That's fine. It's just this one isn't particularly good. So I feel like it's not. It would be better if it had something to do with the plot and was mediocre versus having nothing to do with the plot and being mediocre. Yeah. Well, at least it would have a purpose, but this really doesn't. So then, I mean, then the next story is almost the exact same situation when it comes to the overarching plot, except it deals. It I think does does. Does Cradle of the Snake finally close the door on the goddamn Mara Kate? Uh, Please tell me it does. As, as far as I know. Good. Um, yeah, the, the cliffhanger at the end of, of Whispering Forest is that Tegan's possessed again, <laughs> basically, by the Mara who's it's come back. Um, and it's, a, it's an effective oh shit cliffhanger, at least for me. Um, but I, I like the Mara stories, and this one's no exception. I don't think it's as good as the TV episodes, but I definitely enjoy this audio. I like the other two Mara stories. I don't like this one. Um, Just, I, so the big difference between this and every other Mara story is that this actually this takes place before the Mara have taken over. Right, and on, uh, th we're back to Minusa, the planet from Snake Dance, which is not the same as Kinda, but yeah. Um, yeah, so they, like, they, they travel to Manusa to get help for Tegan from the weird snake charmer guy from Snake Dance. Yeah, but they end up, like, a hundred years, or a few hundred years back in time when Manusa was, like, a modern-day city, basically. Uh, and it's, like, the origins of the Mara. And so the Mara, who has jumped from Tegan into the Doctor, is, like, trying Which to bring about, big, yeah. bring about its own birth. That's the big wrinkle of this story, which that part was interesting. But mm -hmm. my issue with this is I thought the, the Mara slash the Doctor's plan is stupid. It fails constantly. And, well, <laughs> and but, it, it, when did Zagreus happen in the monthly range? Like, what number was that? Uh, 50. Fi okay, so... We've seen the possessed doctor thing done really well before already. Not, like, not Peter Davison, though. No, but we've seen the, the, the possessed doctor. Like we've seen the doctor possessed by evil before. Yes, although although do bear in mind we're very much in the minority on Zagreus, like most people in the <laughs> story. Well, they can go fuck themselves. Yeah, I know, but you know, just just say it. So yeah, I'm just I'm just saying like it's it's it's, it's not a not... traditional Doctor Who story. Huh. It's not a traditional Doctor Who story. It's probably why they don't like it. No, but I'm just saying, like, public opinion was not positive, meaning that it's not like Big Finish looked at it and went, yes, done, you know? No, but, but I'm, what I'm saying is, like, we've seen this done better, and I just, I didn't, I didn't find the Doctor being possessed. Like, I knew he was going to get out of it by the end. Like, I well, was... Well, of course. It's it, and it didn't seem diffi too difficult to stop him either. Like the Mara is supposed to be this ultimate force of evil, and it's then you know using the Doctor's brilliance. And I was like, it was it was too easy. Uh, to a degree, I, I think there were some very smart things that the Mara did with the Doctor's also, ability, though. Like for for example, for example, uh, there there is a point where the companions uh, minus Nissa, I guess, because she's she's possessed too eventually. Um, because that's what happens to Nyssa. <laughs> um, 
they lock themselves in the TARDIS, and the Doctor, like, okay, so basically the plot is, like, the, the mind's eye crystals from Snake Dance are, like, a mass-produced thing in this time period, and so they're, like, there's this TV personality who's going to use them to, like, make your dreams come true, so you focus on the crystal and the, whatever you're imagining pops out, whatever. Uh, so the Mara is going to use that to manifest. So the Doctor uses the crystal to, like, manifest himself an extra TARDIS key to get in there after them, which I thought was very smart. Yeah, but I... I'm not sure if that, like, I, that whole dreams becoming reality thing was so, it's so vague that I, I'm not, I don't know if it should, like, is it, ju is it the actual TARDIS key or is it just a physical representation of it and then it wouldn't work, like. I mean, it's, it's, it works well enough to get in, so, I mean, take that as you will. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's implied that a certain distance away from the crystal, the things won't function anymore. But yeah, also, I imagine they were close enough. Um, they we're dealing with the security guard lady who, who is seems a, to also be a safety inspector and also a cop. Yes, but also is voiced by a big Finnish mainstay. Who isn't she the 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 evil the corporation leader from the theme park planet story? Oh shit, maybe. I don't know. It's weird because this one, I just, like, I recognize, I looked, like, I recognize that voice. She's been in multiple other audios. <laughs> as, yeah, as I, I looked in the Big Finish <laughs> app, looking specifically to find out who was playing her. And yeah, it's, it's an actress who has played multiple different characters using her exact same delivery. Yeah, I couldn't find out who it was though, because like on the app, it listed like the regulars, and then everyone else was just kind of yeah. Everyone else is listed. Peter oh, Davison, like Peter Davison, the Doctor, Janet Fielding, Tegan, you know, Sarah Nessa, Trillo. And then the rest of the cast is listed as Dan Stevens, Vernon Dopcheff, and Hugh Fraser. And something tells me that she is none of those guys. No. And it doesn't even say who those three men play either. So, <laughs> like... They're probably the, the, the magician, the scientist, and the... The, uh, the, the guy, the... Um, the bitch boy. The imaginary well, yeah. bitch boy. Who, who from like halfway through the story, I was like, he's made up. He's yep. not real. Yeah. <laughs> I got that immediately. That was not a reveal. Well, they thought it was. <laughs> I know they thought it was. I was like, <laughs> they made their, their hints too obvious. Yeah, I agree with you there, for sure. Um, That's why, like, I don't hate this story. It's fine. It was okay. It was just... It wasn't as good as the other Mara stories, and I just... It's not that the Mara are bad, and I get Tegan has a special connection to them. It's just so many so fast. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I, I agree. And, but, I mean, I think part of this is the fact that, like, you know, for us, it's fast, but for, you know, if you were listening in re or watching in release order, it's yeah, 1983 know. to 2009, like... And I think another part of it, too, is, like, this is the first time that Tegan had really been part of the team again on audio. T uh, Janet Fielding was much like Tom Baker, where she said no to Big Finish for, like, 10 years. And so I guess when they got her back, they were so excited that, to have her back that they're like, well, we, ha we have Tegan, we have to do a Mara story. Um, I, I mean, I get it. It's just, like... I'm not making any excuse. I'm just saying, like, that, that seems to me that what the thought process was. And I'm pretty sure they did have plans to do a third Mara story on TV, but never happened. So oh, fuck. Uh, what? That's too much. That's that's way too much. Yeah, I kind of agree. Um, but I, I mean, for me, this does feel a little bit different to the previous ones, just in that it's the Mara in a modern city setting. That almost yeah, reminded like, me of something like Parasite Eve. I, I get that. It's just like I said, I, I felt like the Mara's plan was a little dumb this time. Well, it's basically like, yeah, they kind of like hijack this broadcast and manifest itself and like tries to take over by basically threatening people and scaring the shit out of them. Um, and because it's supposed to be like based on our own dark impulses, I, I, I felt like it should have been more of a a willing corruption than, yeah. than, a, than a strong arm tactic. But at the same time, I think they they do a good job of keeping the Mara somewhat threatening because I think both Janet Fielding and Peter Davison do a good job performing evil. Oh, the performances are great. I just felt like 
but it just I just think like at this point I, I just like think they short changed the Mara and the Doctor like intelligence wise in the, the plotting of this episode like they it didn't felt have like as much of a struggle as I thought they would. Yeah, well, and like I like said, like an I internal the struggle. The Doctor's plan is dumb, and then it's like, oh, you need to do this, it's, and it's like he he gives orders to his lackeys, and they come back, and like no one does anything right, and it's just like it's almost like comedic. Mm-hmm. For a story that's supposed to be like dark and foreboding and, and about breaking the time stream and, and oh the yeah because the Mara's like, not supposed to be born for like another hundred <laughs> years but it's like fuck it we'll do it now and the Mara has stolen its page out of uh, the uh, mythical beasts and where to find them and is, and is trying to cheat history <laughs> yes it is I, yeah I mean I I think at this point they're stretching the Mara concept a little bit far yeah like. And I think it, it, it does lack a certain bite that you might expect from a from a story with this this core idea. And I kind of hated both the Doctor, not not the Doctor, you know, Doctor Who, the Doctor, but the Doctor who was they were trying to get Tegan help with. I was going like, to oh, oh yeah, the, the you mean the, the and the rivalry with the with the yeah. German accent because that's never been done before. <laughs> yeah, the, the the German doctor and then the the television mind crystal guy. Like I hated their rivalry. I hated both their characters. I thought they were stupid. I liked I liked the and, the TV mind crystal guy because it reminded me of the uh, the showman from Snake Dance with the Hall of Mirrors. It, it mean, was it was only, to me it was almost like an echo of that that sort I of guess, involvement of like, the entertainment. Like, like the showman with the Hall of Mirrors, he only existed to get that to to both have the 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 imaginary boy and then that scene with the imaginary creatures. Like, mm-hmm. like I feel like you could have rewritten that character and it would have been fine. I just didn't like the way that character. It, that whole side plot was just a waste of time because they both both the the mind crystal guy and the doctor failed in their tasks and. The doctor had to like do everything, and Flash the Mara had to do everything himself. That's true, but I don't know. I mean, like, and this this is like, the, I, I just felt like there was some striking imagery in this. Like, I really enjoyed the the trip into Tegan's mind at the beginning. Me too. Well, and then like, I like said, with, when, with it's like her fear of flying thing, and then the, like she she sees Nissa and Turlo as literal sheep, <laughs> which I thought was funny. Yeah, they was really that that part was great. Um, and then, and like, then like, like just like the the city is like preparing for New Year's too in Manusa, and it's like the idea of like this lit up New Year's skyscraper with this giant snake coiling around in it is like, I don't know. I thought that was a cool idea. And and that scene where they go to the TV studio and see the weird imaginary menagerie was super cool too. Yeah, and I uh, the other thing that I really enjoyed in this is just how out of sorts Turlo is, because Nissa and Tegan were there for the other two Mara stories, so this yeah, is all new to Turlo, and he's like, uh, he's like, uh, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> it's like, it's is really Tegan great. contagious? Like, what the hell is this? <laughs> so he was he was a highlight of the story for me, just trying to like navigate this ridiculous situation that the other three are like, oh yeah, it's this again. He's like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> like, yeah. But uh, but yeah. So like, I did overall. I did like it. It's just, I'm not sure. Uh, I think you might be right. I think Whispering Force might have been just a bit weaker because it because we've literally seen it all before. Yeah, but I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I agree with your criticisms of Cradle of the Snake to a point. I just enjoyed it in spite of that. And and I am a Mara fan to begin with. So I was just. I was already didn't need the giant crow monster. I didn't need another ethereal force of nature villain mm-hmm. this week. Yeah, no, that's, Even that's fair. The story wasn't. The story was decent overall, yeah. and it, like like you said, it it has some really great imagery. It just also has some writing problems. Yeah, I mean, if any, I I still think it's like <laughs> it's worth your purchase more than Whispering Forest if yes. you happen to yeah, be interested. I would definitely agree with that. Though, but yeah, it, to, to my knowledge, I think this is the only time Big Finish has done the Mara, and I think that's for the best. I don't like it's not like the Daleks where there's an army of them and they can just keep coming back. It's almost like it's a very personal kind of threat, and it's especially tied to Tegan specifically. So you can so only do that so many times. If you're, you know, trying to follow the Rictus Syndrome story, the, both of these stories kind of have nothing to do with it, but are part of that plot line. Yeah, so. yeah. 
But I mean, Whispering Forest okay, probably bro. more so because they at least give it lip service, whereas Cradle of the Snake is more like, Tegan's nuts, let's go deal with this. <laughs> yes. I mean, they did at least link it at the end of Whispering Forest, so it does still feel like a continuous piece. Um, which which I appreciate, and I, and I do think it made for a strong cliffhanger that kind of woke me up out of being bored. But <laughs> What know. happened to taking Turlo home, though? He is still trying to get home, and that's he does mention that in a few of the a few of the episodes where Nissa's like, "You've got to get me back to my station so I can make the cure and we can do the research and find the Richter syndrome." And and Turlo's like, "I thought I was going." Home. Yeah, <laughs> and the doctor's like, "Yeah, whatever. We got to deal with this Richter Richter thing first. So, so is this whole story arc before Turlo? Yeah, I guess it would have to be because Nissa has to leave before Turlo can go home. Yeah. God damn it, Kate. <laughs> Yeah. What have you done to us? I have introduced you to the wonderful world of ear stories. <laughs> the, the, the big finish is the company that does not know when to leave a gap alone. <laughs> no. God, no. There isn't even a gap. I mean, there is. There is in that they don't like lead directly into each other, and the TARDIS is notorious for taking the long way around. That's true. So it's, it's not as bad as some of the other ones, I think. But it, it's, it's not like... It's not like cramming 600 episodes with Sarah Kingdom into Dalek's master plan. Or, or like what they've done with the new series is purposefully introduce giant gaps to fill with other stuff. Yeah, yeah. I've, even, I've heard that Stephen Moffat even calls those big finish gaps. So. Really? <laughs> yes. It's like there's that, there's that specific part in um, The Impossible Astronaut where Matt Smith comes back. He's like, I've been gone for like 300 years. Yeah, exactly. And then there's a part in the season 10 premiere where the doctor's like, I'm, I'm, you know, like nearly 2000 years old. Or he says, I'm like 2000. It's like, Oh fuck. <laughs> they added a bunch more. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting with, with the fifth doctor specifically, because it's, there are, there are gaps here and there, but like, there's not, there's not really any gaps where he's doctors stories in general have a lot of momentum to them. They, they're very interconnected and there's like you can you can do you can insert more stories with a specific TARDIS team but you can't create a whole new era the way that you could with 6, 7, and 8 because like there's no point where Peter Davison is ever alone. Like there always is another companion. So like even for like the Weeping Angel story where he is by himself like they had to create a situation where they ship Nissa off for a bit. You yeah. know like it's it's and that's one of the reasons why I think this Richter syndrome arc is interesting is because he doesn't have any other long plot lines like this because it's really hard to find a place where they could go. Except after the Richter syndrome arc, basically. Well, <laughs> they found a gap. You can just keep putting stuff in that gap unless this arc ends specifically with them going into the TV story. Yeah, there's another one later with Perry where they, they put a lot of Perry audios in between two TV stories, but um, but we'll get there when we get there. Yeah, so what's up next time, Kate? Well, what's up next time is that because there have been no new releases that we care about... Uh, <laughs> oh, oh yeah, that's one thing I forgot to bring up. The, uh, the recast First Doctor episodes, or, or the box set is out, but I'm not paying full price for that because I don't care. Now, is this the big finish recast, or did they get the guy who's playing him on TV? Both. They've got the guy who's playing him on TV and filled Ian, Barbara, and Susan with new people. Oh. Interesting. But, uh, like I've said many times, like the, the appeal of Big Finish to me is new episodes with the same actors and the same cast. And so, once it gets to the point where the thing is totally recast, I'm not interested anymore. Like, with Tim Trelore as the third Doctor, Elliot Chapman, it's fine because he's still, he's there to fill a hole with the rest of the actual cast. Um, and But once, once it becomes a point where it's, like, almost entirely new people, or in this case, entirely new people, I'm kind of just, it doesn't have the same appeal to me. Well, I think, I think the sentiment we will, that you are trying to express is when it goes on sale, we'll pick it up and give it a try, and that'll determine whether we, you know, like stay current with it or get it when it's on sale. I think, I think at least for me, it's definitely a. I'll get it on sale for the podcast thing, but if it was just me, I wouldn't bother. I'm sure you'd try one. I mean, eventually, probably not. But I did just pick up Sherlock Holmes, which I swore I'd never, yeah. I never like. 
I've got too much big finish on my wish list already. I'll never buy stuff that's not Doctor Who because I'm not doing it for the podcast. So blah blah blah. And then it was like, then I saw the like description of like Sherlock Holmes versus Jack the Ripper and Sherlock Holmes meeting Dracula and stuff. I'm like, all right, fine for three bucks. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll try it. But no, I told if and if it's just like if it's like the level of the fourth Doctor Adventures, I wouldn't want to listen to it either. Unless no. it's like on sale and we'll pick it up and we'll you know fill it in our canon because it's technically canon. But I mean, it's hard to <coughs> it's it's hard to to swallow for me because it's not like I mean you know again like Tim Trelaw or Elliot Chapman they're filling in for actors who have been dead for decades. And in the case of David Bradley filling in for William Hartnell, if they had brought in just him and then the rest of the regular actors, I would be okay with that. But it's hard to justify a whole new cast for me when you still have Carol Ann Ford, you still have Peter Purvis, you still have Maureen O'Brien, you still have uh, Annika Wills. Like, I suppose. Many of the it's... actors of that era are still around, and to just like recast seems kind of like callous to me. And I know that like for the season one team, it's hard. Because even though William Russell is still alive, he is not doing any more audios because he's 90 fucking 100 years old. Um, and understandably so. And so you're stuck with just Susan. I get that. But maybe it's time to let it go for a while. Maybe. But we'll see. Instead of doing that, and, I, and don't, look, like, it's not just classic series stuff. Like I felt the same way about the Ninth Doctor Chronicles where it was Nick Briggs writing for Nick Briggs, starring Nick Briggs, and it was like, just because Christopher Eccleston said no doesn't mean you have to run out and do this right now. <laughs> like, just wait. You've got so many other. You've got War Doctor. You've got River. So you you got all kinds of shit. Just what like, is just Christopher chill. Eccleston even doing lately? Who the fuck knows? Being mad, I think. <laughs> this is kind of his thing. I don't know. I've only seen him in. I've seen him in Doctor Who, and the only other stuff I've seen him in is like old, like Cracker or Heroes. What about G.I. Joe? Oh, yeah, that. Oh, and he was oh. he was the evil elf from Thor. Yeah, I forgot That's about true. that. I don't know what the fuck. Anyway, whatever. The point is, is like, you can, you can just let things be, Big Finish. I know it's hard, but you can do it. Yeah. Anyway. And so I wait, unplugged my headphones because I'm an idiot. Just hang on. <laughs> what? Did, did you say what we're doing next week, Kate? No, oh, I don't. Yeah, so okay. did. We went on this big tangent about tangent, Big Finish releases instead of saying what we're supposed to be listening to. Well, you know what? Big Finish's official podcast is like almost entirely tangents as well, so don't feel too bad. <laughs> well, that's, um, that's what podcasts are. I guess, never mind. That is what podcasts are. We just pretty much be a little more focused. Yes. Anyway, okay, so next week, the second tr trilogy of the Richter Syndrome story arc, consisting of Heroes of Sontar, Kiss of Death, and Rat Trap. I like the Sontaran. Well, I hope you still like them. <laughs> I'm sure I will. I liked that Sontaran zombie one. That was one of the, the fifth or that fourth one Doctor ones I enjoyed. Yeah, where they were fighting, the, they were warring with their dead. Mm -hmm. they, uh, anyway, cool. So that's it? Just, that's just for it. the audio? Wow. Yes, sir. Wow, Half we get a break. As much as this week. <laughs> yeah. Just six hours instead of like a hundred. Jeez, I was getting tired writing the fucking episode description. Just, just, just very generically, very shortly putting in everything we listen to. It's like, God damn it, there's so much. There is a lot. I'll, I mean, if it makes you feel any better, we're 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 over halfway through Peter Davison. <laughs> He's only got one more TV season left after this. We're only halfway. Well, he did three seasons, and we're almost. We've only got one story left in his second one, so we're you know, we're getting there. But accounting for the audios, we're probably about halfway. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Well, enjoy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we'll we'll be back next week with more audio. Bye everyone.